This video will cover an approach to hypercalcemia. So hypercalcemia is defined as a calcium level of greater than 2.6. The normal serum calcium is between 2.2 and 2.6 millimoles per liter, and calcium is very tightly regulated by the body because it's involved in many important processes like uh, muscle contractility. So an important thing to note is that calcium is tightly bound to albumin. So in the cases of hypoalbuminemia, you need to correct for that in your calcium calculation. So normal albumin is 40, and the rule is that you add 0 0.2 to the serum calcium every drop in 10 of albumin. So an example is if your albumin is 20, you should add 0.4 to the serum calcium. Another alternative is that you can order an ionized calcium which has a value of between 1.1 to 1.3 and that essentially compensates for an abnormal albumin level. This diagram of calcium homeostasis. So you can see here the four shaded structures are the parathyroid glands and they sense a low serum calcium and as a result they increase PTH secretion. PTH will work directly on the bone to release calcium and phosphorus, resulting in an increased serum calcium. And PTH also works on the kidney to increase calcitriol formation and decrease the excretion of calcium. You can see here the vitamin D pathway. So vitamin D is processed in the liver first into calcidiol, and then goes to the kidney to form calcitriol. And this is the activated form of vitamin D which goes to the small intestine and increases the absorption of dietary calcium, resulting in, again, an increased serum calcium. So next we'll be going over the presentation of hypercalcemia. So a phrase that you can remember is stones, bones, abdominal groans, thrones, and psychiatric overtones. And that just helps you remember at different categories of uh, symptoms. So first of all, the most common presentation of hypercalcemia is a patient that's asymptomatic. Symptoms will show it themselves depending on the rate of rise of calcium and also the absolute value. So stones stands for nephrolithiasis or kidney stones, which are often made of calcium oxalate. Bones for bony pain and pathological fractures. This happens most commonly in cortical bone like the femur and pelvis and this is often in hyperparathyroidism or metastatic disease that you have bony pain and abdominal groans for constipation nausea pancreatitis and peptic ulcer disease and thrones is just another word for the washroom so imagine sitting on the throne and peeing a lot so polyuria psychiatric overtones for depression anxiety anorexia and fatigue which can all of these uh, can lead to confusion and coma and general non-specific symptoms include polydipsia muscle weakness gout and hypertension ecg changes are also possible including arrhythmias and a decrease in acute QT interval So next is the differential diagnosis. Unfortunately, hypercalcemia has a really big differential diagnosis, but the most important ones to know are only two. So the most common cause of hypercalcemia in inpatients is malignancy, and in outpatients, it's primary hyperparathyroidism. If you remember from our diagram of homeostasis, an increased PTH results in an increased calcium of the blood. So it makes sense. And one hint that might be able to differentiate the two is that in malignancy, you often have higher calcium levels, so greater than 3.25. And in hyperparathyroidism, it's more of a mild to moderate elevation. So one of the mnemonics for a more extensive differential diagnosis is chimpanzees. So just to quickly walk through this, C is for calcium overdose. H is hyperparathyroidism, which can be primary, secondary, or tertiary. 
Secondary or tertiary hyperparathyroidism is often associated with chronic renal disease. Eyes for immobility, so patients that are often in ICU or elderly patients that just don't move. And iatrogenic, so drugs to ask about would be lithium and thiazides. M is for milk alkali syndrome, which has a triad of hypercalcemia, decreased renal function, and alkalosis. And this is due to an in excess intake of calcium and antacids, so calcium carbonate or Tums, plus milk. So excess consumption of these two things can result in milk alkali syndrome. P is Paget's disease, which uh, results in osteoclastic bone resorption. A for Addison's disease and acromegaly. And also I put hyperthyroidism in here. It doesn't fit with the A's, but it is an endocrine cause, so I've, I've lumped them together. N is for neoplasm or malignancy. The most common ones resulting in hypercalcemia include breast, lung, uh, multiple myeloma, and lymphoma. Z is for Zollinger-Ellison syndrome. And this one is an increased secretion of gastrin and patients often have ulcers in atypical locations. E is for excess vitamin D or A, and S is for sarcoidosis. Next, we'll be going over an approach to the diagnosis of hypercalcemia. So once you have an increased calcium level, your first step is to confirm that it's actually elevated. You can repeat the calcium, or you can do an ionized calcium. And then you measure the PTH level. The normal is between 1.2 and 5.7. And if it's increased, then you have a PTH-dependent process. There's two choices, the first being primary hyperparathyroidism, and the second is FHH, which stands for familial hypocalciuric hypercalcemia. And in FHH, you can think about it as the body having an increase in the calcium set point. So calcium is um, elevated, but there are often no harmful effects, such as the renal stones and also the GI effects and all those symptoms we talked about in the presentation section. So once you know we have an elevated PTH, you can do one of these two tests. So the first is a 24-hour urine calcium, and if it's decreased, meaning less than 200, that's FHH and it's increased in hyperparathyroidism. So that's how you can differentiate between the two. And another option is to do a calcium to creatinine clearance ratio, which is again low or less than 0.01 in FHH. The other possibility is if your PTH is low, then you have a PTH independent disease. In this situation, your calcium is pathologically increased and your PTH is appropriately decreased. This happens in malignancy, vitamin D intoxication, and granulomatous diseases. So our next step would be to measure the PTH RP. RP stands for related peptide, and also do the vitamin D metabolites. So there's the 125 dihydroxy vitamin D, also known as calcitriol, and 25 hydroxy vitamin D, which also known as calcidiol. If your PTHRP is elevated, you can scan for malignancy, so often a breast, lung, or hematologic cancer. If your calcitriol is increased, you should do a chest x-ray um, and look for lymphoma or also sarcoid. If your levels of vitamin D metabolites and PTHRP are normal, it's likely due to other causes, which includes multiple myeloma, thyrotoxicosis, and vitamin A toxicity. And lastly, if you have an increase of calcidiol, that's often due to intoxication with medications, vitamins, or herbal supplements. So in terms of investigations, you need to do basic blood work, so CBC, then diff, um, renal function tests, extended lights, which usually includes calcium, phosphate, and magnesium, 
You can do a PTH, PTHRP, as we talked about, vitamin D metabolites, um, SPEP and UPEP are for multiple myeloma, TSH, and vitamin A levels. Imaging that may help includes chest x-ray and CT, often with contrast is better for looking for uh, malignancies, but you also have to consider their renal function and whether or not they can take contrast. Uh, often you need to look in the chest and the abdomen and also you can do a bone scan for malignancy. Lastly, we're going to talk about the management of hypercalcemia. So it's based on severity. Um, anything that's less than three is often treated conservatively, so oral hydration is encouraged. Between three and 3.5, these levels are often tolerated if they're chronically at this level but an acute rise to between 3 and 3.5 can result in an altered sensorium. And more than 3.5 definitely needs treatment. So the first option is IV normal saline, given at 2 to 300 mils per hour. And you need to titrate that rate to a urine output of about 100 to 150 mils per hour. And giving fluids essentially just helps the kidneys get rid of that excess calcium. Furosemide works in a similar way to increase urinary calcium excretion. It's also useful because through giving IV normal saline, you may end up with an edematous patient and the furosemide can correct for that. Calcitonin is given intramuscularly or subcutaneously every 6 to 12 hours. It works really quick, so within hours, but tolerance develops after 48 hours. Bisphosphonates are used, uh, in this case only IV bisphosphonates, and the mechanism of action is to inhibit bone resorption and inhibit osteoclasts. The choices are zoledronic acid and pimidronate, both of which have a different side effect profile, so to look them up before you choose either one. And you need to adjust their dosing for impaired renal function. Then we have prednisone, which is only used for vitamin D related mechanisms. These include uh, vitamin D intoxication, granulomatous diseases, and multiple myeloma. And prednisone and its effects in hypercalcemia, there are many, but you can think of prednisone or steroids in general as inhibiting osteoblasts and decreasing the calcium absorption in the GI, which increases calcium excretion. And if you remember, um, steroids also cause osteoporosis, so calcium wasting. That's a good way to remember the mechanism of prednisone. Lastly, we have dialysis, which is often a last resort, or it's a good option in patients that are already on dialysis, and then you can avoid all the drugs and that's it. So that was the approach to hypercalcemia. I hope you enjoyed it. If you feel like you've learned something, please click on the like button and click on subscribe if you'd like to keep up to date with these videos. Any questions, you can leave them in the comments below or you can email me at approach2internalmedicine at gmail.com. So thanks for tuning in.